Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to an uh, important presentation, at least from my perspective. Uh, so we are going to have a little talk together about contribution burnout. Uh, so we are first going to give a very brief presentation just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, what we want to discuss today, uh, so that we are talking about the same topic and can understand each other maybe a little bit better. And we also will provide a brief tips from ourselves that if you feel right now that you are burned out, something that might help you get through that. So, um, who we are, that's probably inter uh, interesting for you. We are just gonna briefly introduce ourselves by name. I'm Lauri Eskola, I'm the Drupal Steam System Maintainer and I come from Finland. And my name is Michael, or people also know me on Schnitzel. Um, I work at the Mitsu Labs, and sometimes I work a lot. So I had to find solutions, how to um, work around that, and I'm happy to share them. So here is the topics that we are gonna discuss today. This is like, uh, so the three first are what we are going to cover in the presentation, and then we are going to discuss how we could make the community more, more sustainable and not make people inside the community feel burned out. So uh, I'd like to first, just to make sure, tell everyone what burnout is in the terms of, in the eyes of medical professionals. So there's two different uh, medical refer re reference books, uh, and they don't align at all in terms of defining burnout. So DSM-5, which is the reference book for mental health professionals and is provided by the American Psychiatric, Psychiatric Association, doesn't recognize burnout as a medical disorder at all. Then there is the ICD-10, which is International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, uh, provided by the World Health Organization has a topic about burnout. But it's, so the ICD-10 defines burnout as a life management difficulty and defines that the symptoms of burnout are similar to the depression. So for this reason, burnout is quite complicated because even the medical professionals can define what burnout actually is. It's something that is very personal and depends on the person. Personal, person's per, personal opinion and view. So the, the most common symptoms of burnout is that every day is a bad day, nothing is feeling good. It's, it's a little bit like that person. Uh, you are exhausted all the time and caring about your work or home and life seems like a total waste of energy. Um, it might be hard to focus on any tasks. It might, might be hard to get any things done. Uh, and it's just mostly about that you don't feel like doing anything or you don't feel like that you want you want to work on something. Uh, one of the most common misunderstandings I see people are making is that burnout is being mistaken with the stress. Because of s stress, like uh, burnout, you have to, in order to be burned out, some, something has to be burning to burn out. So I would define stress as the pace where something is burning. And then when the fire is going down, the then you are burned out. So when you're stressed, usually people have over-engagement to their work, uh, which means that they want to work a lot. They want, they want to try hard. But when you are burned out, then you actually feel disengagement and you don't want to work anymore. And the problem in this is that you, in the stress, you feel like you don't have the energy to do that, but you want to do something. But when you are burnt out, instead you might have the energy to do all the things, but you don't have the motivation, ideals, or hope to work on the things. Also, uh, stress is something that may kill you pre prematurely. Uh, in some countries, there is even a definition for a death that is being caused by stress. Uh, burnout, instead, doesn't kill anyone but it might uh, may life seem not worth living. So burnout is mo even more a, it's a mental, mental problem. 
instead of stress being a physical problem. We did a community survey uh, a few weeks ago where we figured out that 76 out of 100 contributors have felt burnout at some point. Uh, around 100 people filled the survey. Um, it doesn't fully, the, the, the survey didn't define if the reason is open source contributions because it's very hard for people to tell what is the exact reason for the burnout. So we didn't even want to, we didn't even want to try to ask them for that. Also, there is the common misunderstanding of what is burnout, if it's stress or burnout. So what is causing burnout in Drupal community? We tried to ask people like diff different kind of mindsets that people are having that, that has felt burnout. And we found out that the, definitely the most common and only thing that popped up very clearly was that they are being expected to be too many things to too many people. And 65% of all the uh, response, responses for the survey told, that, told us that they have been expected to, to, to be too many things to too many people. Uh, which actually kind of makes sense because at some point when I was feeling burnout, I felt like I'm being expected to be too much. And then I had to try to uh, figure out a way to not feel like that. Drupal is also a meritocracy which creates its own problems. 75% uh, of the responses say that it, uh, the reason why they work on, to do open source contributions is that they want to achieve something. Um, and it's like there is a rainbow and you are trying to go towards the gold in the end of the rainbow, but then at some point there is just a dust. So what, what, I, what I'm trying to say that people think that when they work harder, they think that they can achieve something more. And then they try to work all the time even harder to reach another levels. But at, at some point, it is just not possible to reach new levels. And people should understand that it might not be for it at some, at some point, because people are doing crazy things towards the open source contributions. Then there was one very interesting note we made on the, on the survey that 55% uh, of the people didn't feel like they have enough control over their work while doing open source contributions, which is a very interesting note because when you're working on open source contributions, there should be no one controlling your work. So personally, I don't have any reason why someone would say that they don't have control over their work while they are doing open source contributions. But this is definitely something that is notable because of the fact that it's so, so weird, at least for me. Maybe someone else has a reason. We can discuss this later. And then there was the bonus, which was a positive thing we found out, that uh, we are very good at giving recognition and rewards for good work, which is, which is positive from our side. And 63% of the people say that they feel like they are giving given enough recognition and rewards for their good work. One thing we also did during the session, uh, during the, the survey, we asked people if they actually do something against um, feeling burned out. And not everybody answered it was just a free text field, um, but a lot of people just said no. It was a plain no, a sad smiley face sometimes. And, um, and I feel that's really, that, that's a help um, shout from people that they don't know what to do. They are in the situation if they're now stressed out or burned out or whatever. And I think we, we are really good in sharing, but we are all, we're in, in code, we're really good in sharing other things, but we're not really good in sharing about our personal lives or things that really worked. So what I'm trying to do, I would just, um, giving things that really worked well for me um, on how to even prevent to get to a point that you feel burned out. Um, and we can go um, through them. I think the first important thing for me is that there is no shame in working a lot. A lot of people feel that they're not allowed to talk about it because everybody can do it. Um, so just work a bit more, just work two hours more. I mean, what, where's the problem? And, and I feel that, that we, maybe as Drupal, maybe as a whole society, are really bad in like, 
um, or making it a shame. So I feel myself, I don't feel ashamed if I work more, but the other part, there's also no pride in it. Um, I feel also a lot of people, they pride with saying like, I worked a lot and I can handle all these things. Um, and I think that's also bad. So it's just a problem. Everybody has to find its own level of how much he wants to do, how much he can do. And as long as he's happy with that, everything is good. If he's not happy, then we should help each other. So let's go through the things that worked for me. First of all, drink a lot. <laughs> Why? Interestingly, there is a lot of these tools that, or apps for the effort for, for Macs and PCs that tell you like you should get up now. They never worked out for me at all because I deinstalled them after two days because I hate them. The problem is, or the good thing is, when you drink a lot, you have to pee. And you cannot really stop doing that. So it forces you to get up, to walk around, you move your body, you give your eyes a rest. And a lot of the things, like when I'm stuck, I walk around and then suddenly you walk two steps and you have the solution. So it also gives your, with moving your body, you give your brain a change and that helps a lot. So I do it with having a water bottle on the table and that's really important. If you have water somewhere else, you, non, you don't get up to get that water. You, have, you need it on the table. And another really interesting thing that works for us, we have a Slack bot that tells each other to drink water. I just started, I had a small curl, and every time I drink water, I press the button, and in, in, in the Slack channel, it tells everybody the friendly water, but it reminds you to drink water, and it worked. People started to drink more water, people felt more happy. So that's how my desk looks when it's cleaned up. Um, so there's a water bottle there. We have personalized water bottle in the office. Um, people can have it with gas, without gas, but it's there all the time. And because just it's there, you take it and um, you drink it. So it's, it's really easy. The only thing you have to do, you have to fill it up when it's empty. So that you have to get into some routine, and that's hard, but um, that actually works really well. The next thing I do, I try to relax in any t somehow once per day. And it really depends what it is. Everybody has something different. But I really try to keep it as a ritual that something that relaxes me. And for myself, it's actually showering in the morning. I shower every morning ritually. If I only get six hours sleep, I only sleep five and a half hours to at least shower in the morning. And it's a ritual that gets you up, that lets me think about what I'm doing today, what is the plan, what is good, what should I work? And we'll see later on, there's more things to think about today, and I do that during showering. It doesn't mean that this works for everybody. Some other people, I talk to other people, they do sports. Some other people watch their favorite TV show. Some other people do whatever, it doesn't matter. But I think everybody should have something that he can also go back and relax at least once per day to have some sand time in their day. The next thing that really worked well for me is divide your day. If you look at the day, at least for me, it's I have a lot of time that I need to focus that I need to focus without distraction. And distraction can either be the IRC channel, it can be an email, it can be coworkers, it can be clients, it can be my phone, it can be basically everything. But I need to focus. I need to focus at least two to three hours per day to work on some things. And what I found is that it helped me a lot if I find time during the day where there is not distraction. So there's one possibility you just go offline for work. To be honest, didn't work for me at all because I feel really stressed while, not, while being offline because I could miss something. Um, so that didn't work. Like just turning off everything doesn't work for me at all. I, I'm more stressed during that time. Um, so therefore, what I found, I just work while others are not. Myself, I get up at 5.30 in the morning and work for two hours from six to eight where like nobody really is in the office. Um, and it's crazy to get up that early, but it's the only thing that actually helped me to be in the time because during these two hours, there is not a lot of people are online. Um, my clients are not calling me yet. The coworkers are not there. And it made me happier. It made me happier to, to have that focus time to work during that time. And the other thing that is also important, at least for me, that I saw where it worked really well, is try to divide your day into fun and not fun stuff. Everybody does fun stuff, and everybody does not so fun stuff. So in the morning, I think about, while showering, 
what is the not fun stuff I have to do today? And I'm trying to do it as fast as possible in the morning, so I have it done. But at one point, I feel stressed a bit. I feel stressed about it, and I feel, okay, now, it, that's not, like, it's not going to work. And then I switch to the fun stuff, which is maybe not the most fun you can do, but whatever it is, maybe it's things that you like to do more. And then you do that, but you give you a specific amount of time because it's dangerous because you could end up in doing the fun stuff all day long. So you just give yourself, let's say, an hour to whatever depends on you really things, what you do to do these fun things and then switch back. And this back and forth helps me to do the things because if I'm, if I'm just pushing the not fun in front of me, I'm going to do it in the evening because I have to, because on the next day there is something or there is a patch or whatever. There so many people are waiting on, and it just stresses yourself out. The next is find a coach. What we all do, and I feel that's not specifically to Drupal, that's not specifically to open source. We all do high, like we deliver things or we do things like, um, like sport, like people in the Olympics. They train a lot, we do a lot, we work a lot, and they all have coaches. It's perfectly fine to somebody in sports to have a coach. Everybody has a coach. So why don't we need a coach that just supports you? And I have on myself, I have friends that are in the same situation that, that, that we talk about. And there's one really, really important thing. Don't judge each other. It's not about judging. It's not about telling each other you're doing wrong or right. It's just about what works for you, exchanging, telling each other, how did you handle these specific things? It's just a person that you can talk to. Maybe it's a group that helps you. Because with saying the things that you do, a lot of the times you realize if it's good or bad for yourself. Because if you just do it, you never think about it. But when you have to explain it to somebody else, it's suddenly you're in a different mindset in your brain, and that helps. And then sometimes you see the other people completely freaking out. Like they look at you and say, like, wow, well, like you're a zombie. And then maybe that reflects to you, and you think about, okay, what do I do wrong? So I think um, it's also important to discuss about what doesn't work um, in terms of, like, that's what I'm doing. And maybe somebody else has another idea. So talking about it just helps and also reduces the level of, um, that everybody thinks that only I have that problem. And what I really like to do is a sanity check. So I said that before about the zombies. Like I, 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 I tell myself I do as much work per week that I still after the week can say, okay, I'm still overall happy with it. Of course, I do things that I don't so much like and I do things that I a lot of like. But at the end, I'm trying to sanity check myself and maybe also with others to just to ask the question, are you still happy with your situation? And if you say no, you have to change something. If you say yes, you can go on. And that's not about working. That's not about specifically working. That's about any way in life with the Drupal community, with anything that we do that we give to others. The easy thing that everybody tells, and um, there, to be honest, it's not that easy, is if the slides work, is delegating. So um, one thing that I really um, took me a lot of time is if we delegate, we already know that maybe the person that we delegated to will not do it perfectly. So we do it ourselves. And that's really dangerous. What I read and what I also feel, if somebody else can do it by 70% that you can do it, that's good enough because you can fill in the last 30%. But you can do now two things or even three things at the same time while others are doing it for you. So delegating is not about giving it to somebody else and that person does it completely. It's about giving it to somebody else and supporting that person and maybe checking it and together as a team um, do more. So it's about controlling and steering and not executing. It doesn't mean you give it to somebody and you never talk to that person anymore. You give it to somebody and you check with that person to fill in the, the rest of the 30%. And in the Drupal community, we have a really great thing, and it's called a novice tag. So we can tag something with a novice tag, and it means that somebody that maybe um, did not or doesn't cannot do the 100% as you do can take it on. And in the end, teamwork is more fun. It's more fun to work together 
and it helps others also to learn. So that person will learn from you and will maybe be next time on 80% on maybe 90%. And then maybe at one point you can give, you can actually delegate also the delegating or the responsibility to that, to that person. So it's a process that we have to work. And I think that is really important that we, that we understand that just putting a novice tag on something doesn't mean that now it's gone forever. That person still needs time. Or even, even if we give it to somebody on IRC, that person maybe wants to have information about us. What I do to know if I delegate enough or not, I time track my work. So I time track all the work that I do on specific things. And a week later, I look at what I worked on. And I review saying, OK, well, here I spent a lot of time, or that I could have delegated. So it's about the reviewing process that I realize. Because when, while you're in it, it's really hard to realize what should I do now because it's really important and I'm the only person that can do it right now. In that situation, yes, that's maybe what that's maybe the truth for yourself. But afterwards, a couple of days later, if you review it again, you realize, okay, maybe that wasn't really the case. So that's how I use time tracking. So I can go back later and I know what I worked on and also how many how much time did I work on each things. Next one is saying no. If people ask you to do something, they ask you. They're not demanding. Most people, or we as a Drupal community, were really good in asking each other. We're not demanding from each other. We're not saying, you need to help me that. We say, can you help me? And that also means we can say no. Or if you feel you cannot say no, you can say yes, but not now. It, we don't have to say yes all the time. And a no isn't offending. It's not something that you say, like, no, that's, what a, that's a dumb question or anything. It's just us saying, I don't have time right now, and that's perfectly fine. And what I try a lot is I also encourage when people come to me and say, can you help me with that? When I maybe have time, instead of just taking over it and, and doing it completely for them, I encourage them to try it themselves. So they can then learn. Um, and they next time they maybe don't have to ask anymore. So it's all the time about teaching each other and trying to get people better so that we don't have to like do the, the handling all the time. One of the really important things for me is listen to your body. Your body talks to you constantly. And I think sometimes we, f we forget about that. And I think if you just listen, and if you listen carefully enough, he tells us, or it tells us, um, when to stop. So myself, it's about if I have any kind of vision issue. So sometimes you're sitting in front of the desk, you don't, lo you don't watch, look at your watch, and I feel like, okay, my eyes are strange. And then you look at, at, at your watch, and you realize it's 3 o'clock in the morning. So your inner watch doesn't tell you it's 3 o'clock, but your body tries to talk to you. Um, or any other strange. I talk to other people and everybody has some other way that their body tells, hey, okay, now it's time to, to do. So there's a lot of different ways. Um, and I can't tell you exactly what it is for you, but it can be out there um, or it can be that your body tries to talk to you. Um, the next thing is headaches. And the slides don't work at all. That doesn't matter. Um, so headaches is a bit a hard thing of myself um, because they come quite fast. So it's for me, it's not only headache. Like if if you if you have a headache, it's not for me the time to stop. It's just to be the careful. It's to be careful. Maybe I forgot to drink water. Maybe I should eat something. But it's not yet the time to stop. So there's there's different levels, and you really have to find out yourself how it is for you. And then the next one, sleeping. Obviously, I myself try to give myself at least six hours of sleep every day. And if that is not possible, I really try to do more later on, but to get six hours. Um, there's a lot of ways of how to fall, fall asleep faster, and I won't cover them all now. But um, if you're interested, if you research a bit, there's a lot of ways of how to fall asleep faster, and it's astonishing how good they work. Um, so if you have problems with falling asleep, there is a lot of talk to me or there's a lot of things online. The next one is about expectations. I try to tell my people when I know, and my people means friends, my girlfriend, 
whatever, people around me that work with me, that I will be working a lot because I will be more stressed. They will feel that I work more. And if when I pre-inform them, they know that these things are there. So with telling them, it makes it much easier for them. And what I learned is if I give any time estimations, that's no matter in work, no matter if my girlfriend asks me, okay, how long do you have to work today? Or how long are you doing it? Multiply it at least by two. Maybe she will be upset because whatever, you're going to miss something or whatever. But she will be less upset if you actually show up on time that you said than if she waits there and you're not done. And I think that's one thing. It's just try it out. Maybe it's 1.5, maybe it's 2.5, maybe it's five times. It doesn't matter, but just find it out what it is for you. We are really bad in estimation. One other thing that everybody tells you when you feel stressed, just start another hobby. Just start something else. For me, completely didn't work out at all. Why? Because you feel stressed. You feel stressed to now have another thing. I have to do that now because I'm so stressed in the other, so I have to do that. And now suddenly you have two things that you, that you put yourself on. So really only do them if you really, really like them. Don't start one just because somebody told you you should. It can be that it really, really helps you. It can be, but it doesn't mean that just because it works for somebody else, it works for you. But don't give up too early. If you start something, don't give up off, off, after one day. Don't give up, give up after two days. Give it at least two weeks or whatever depends on what it is, what you do. Give it some time to get into your schedule, but review it and say, um, okay, that maybe works or that doesn't work. It's a challenge. It never, we, we never stop improving. So I think it's about that. So overall, I think, and it doesn't work at all, <laughs> um, I feel we shouldn't fight working a lot or situations where we have to work a lot. It doesn't help at all to fight against it. We have to accept it that the situation is there and we have to find solutions. And you will maybe not find a solution immediately it will maybe take you two, three, four months to, to reiterate over it and find the good solutions. But they are out there, and we all can do it. So, and, and I think we should try to more talk with each other about it. I guess then we are ready to talk about the, what we could as a community do to make our community more sustainable and make Drupal something that doesn't burn people out. Even though it's, it's, it depends a lot on the person's uh, personal, personal things they select and what they choose to do. But we, we should still try to, uh, as a community, find solutions, how we could help those people, and is there some, some things that are burning out people more than other things? So if you have an idea, so if you have an idea, there is a mic. Uh, please introduce you by name, at least. Hey, this is uh, Angie with WebChick. Um, thanks for the talk. I think that, that was really good to kind of get this problem out there. Um, one insight I maybe have to the, um, to the why did people say they had no control when this is open source and it should be for fun. I think that has a lot to do with that there are people nowadays who do get paid to work on Drupal. So there's probably some of that. I think also we as a community have directed that effort in a lot more way. Like right now, if what really makes you happy is working on features, we say no, you can't because we're fixing bugs, right? So I think as a community, we do direct people based on the position of the release cycle, and I think because we've been in bug fix mode for the past however long, three years, um, that that probably has a lot to do with why people feel like they're sort of trapped and they have no control over what they're doing, because if they like contributing to core, but the thing they like to work on is not, not there, they can't. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of ideas, I mean, one thing that, that Dries and I tried to do with the, uh, with the improved governance process, which this was kind of recently, this was like, say, in the last six months, we tried to make it way more explicit. Like, what we saw, the reason, the, the catalyst for that was what we saw in core committers. You know, they were basically, like, I was the release manager for Drupal 7, which meant that single-handedly, well, me and Dries, but I did, you know, more of the work, 
um, had to handle constant pinging from a thousand people on everything. And and then you know even in Drupal eight for a while there we only had like three committers, and now it's grown to six. But we basically it was like in order to fulfill this role of core committer we have to basically find this unicorn superpower person who not only has an unbelievable amount of time they can dedicate to the community, is also pleasant to talk to, and has leadership qualities and technical qualities, all of these things. So we started splitting up those roles. So we said, from now on, we're going to fill core committers as product managers, framework managers, or release managers who have a specific focus. And similarly, we tried to do a different thing with the, with the subsystem maintainers, where it's like identifying usability topic coordinator, documentation topic coordinator, subsystem maintainer. And the idea is defining the roles better so we don't feel the need to be Superman and take on everything that everyone asks of us, and also to, um, to make it explicit what's expected of people so they can know, oh, I definitely don't want that job. Like, you know what I mean? I might think I want to be that person, but when I find out what that person actually has to do, I don't actually want it. So I think one thing that – that was a really long story. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think one thing that can help, though, is, um, is where people tend to spread themselves out too thin – you know, kind of talking to those people and finding out what it, what do you think your role is in this project and why do you tend to do that? And I think you hit on a lot of things. I think a lot of it is I don't trust other people to do this as well as I do or this kind of thing. And I think talking to them a little bit about, like, well, what would make you comfortable delegating that? Like, if we defined a role that was that person and you got to recommend some of that role or if we said uh, that's just something we're not going to do anymore or whatever, I think a lot of people – to your point, they don't have a coach. They don't ever get out of their bubble, and they, they just work, 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 and then, and then don't ever stop to reflect on what they're doing and, and whether that makes sense. So um, you know, maybe it's monthly meetings where we all get together and talk about how we're feeling. I mean, it sounds a little hippy-dippy, but you know, like you know, get on IRC and the Drupal vent channel and just <laughs> whatever. You know? I don't know, but I, I, I think you've hit on a lot of really great things here, so just thanks. So uh, one thing I want to say... It, it was very nice, uh, good to hear that the bus factor in terms of the committers has been made to be a little bit lower. Yeah. But uh, I think there is, in other places, the bus factor should be also made a little bit lower. Like we have maintainers, and we are not updating the maintainers that constantly. And is there anything anyone could think of how we could maybe make that process a little bit easier? Because um, what I personally think uh, at least what we do in the team system and in the, in, like, with the front-end people is we try to have good maintainers in all the subsystems. So, because having a new maintainer that hasn't been around for very long is still better than having someone who is not, not active and who, who is not committed to do the work. And also, there shouldn't be a shame to be taken out of the maintainers of TXT and what I, I've talked to a few of the people who has been taken out from there, and what they say is they feel bad because they are the maintainers. They are being expected to be maintainers, but they can't commit to be a maintainer. And feeling taken out from the maintainers that TXT feels horrible. But after it has happened, they feel very good. So, make that less. so somehow we should find a way how we could make the the bad feeling of getting out from there or the bad feeling of not getting out there a little bit lower. Yeah, so uh, this is Gabor Hoichi. Uh, I'm, I'm leading the multilingual initiative in Drupal 8, and I have a talk tomorrow on what we did in the multilingual initiative, and one of my slides literally says, praise people for hard work and praise people for taking time off. Because... They would, I mean, if people want to take time off, they will take time off anyway. If you don't accept that and if you don't praise them for that, it just sets up, a, there, it just breaks the goodwill and they will not, they will not come back anymore because the whole, whole uh, trust system is broken up. So you just need to accept that they need, that people need to take time off and that's a good thing and you should let them do it. And if you uh, and if you keep a team, as to to Schnitzel's point, if you keep a team working on things, then you have others who can take on that work and do do it for a while. And then if if the person that took time off comes back, then they will see, oh, you moved it forward and uh, you took care of my baby. How nice is that of you? Mm -hmm. And they will be nice to you again. And now if they have time and they they took some uh, relaxed vacation, or if they took care of their family issues or whatever was the reason they took time off. 
um, they will feel good that they have the opportunity being reintegrated into uh, the place they were. So that's one of my points, and I have a lot of other interesting points in my talk tomorrow. If somebody's interested, yeah, so open source project management in a Drupal community. And I, uh, yeah, sorry, I wanted so, to reflect. Uh, just a question. Thank you for a, that was very interesting, and I think you made it. You've done a great job in the multilingual initiative, and it would be great if we could actually uh, copy it into other pieces of Drupal core also. Um, and I think I will come to your presentation to take a look how it's done it there. Yeah, I, I love to mentor people on the things I did right. I did a lot of things wrong, and people in man, and other people in managed to do a lot of th things wrong, and we tried a lot of things and failed in some. But there have been successful stuff that I'm trying to share. And I had some personal ideas. So, the, so since burnout comes a lot of the times out of lack of control, what I try to do is I try to do a variety of things, and then I have things that I have control over, and if I feel stuck in something, then I put that away and do something else I have control over. So for example, I help with event organization. That's totally different from writing patches or arguing with people in the issue queue. So when I'm stuck in there, I just move over to helping with an event, the Drupal Dev Days, whatever, or, or Sprint Organization or something where I have control over because I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I know my role there much, much more well-defined. It's, it's limited, it's focused, and I can make a difference there, and I have success. So, so, that, so that's possible if you mix, your, mix different responsibilities. If you don't want to take on different res responsibilities on that scale, then you can scale this down and say you want to have quick wins. Like one thing I did is I argued with my wife for a while on who does the dishes. Because I can do the dishes and you get the sense of completion at the end because the dishes are done. <laughs> and, you're not, and, and you're not at your computer and stressing out about all, all those things and, and, and feeling helpless. Because you went somewhere else and you completed something and then you're happy. And now we have a dishwasher. Unfortunately, we're not doing dishes anymore. So... <laughs> I'm doing the laundry now, and so I go do the laundry, and then I, I put them out and stuff, and then I get this sense of completion, then, then I got the bonus points in my mind, and then I can go back and use those bonus points to go back and argue in the issue queue. <laughs> Thanks, Cover. No, I know who's going to do my laundry. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, wh one thing I, I wanted to add there, and I had that myself, at one point you feel not a novice anymore, and I had people arguing to me, like, why did you do now that novice? Like, so if you, as a person that creates the novice per tags, and now if you work on one, just because you wanted to, like, okay, I want to, on that sprint, I want to at least see my name in the commit log. Because if you work on it for three months, I mean, you never, you, it's not going to happen, but that's okay. But then sometimes you take one, and you just do it, and it's done, and it's in. Just make a new one. Then. Just make a new one. Yeah. Correct. That's a good point, yes. So I think... It maybe happened once to me that, 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 that then you feel suddenly bad that you take that quick win to take it away from somebody else, but for yourself, you feel good because it's like plus one, and then I can go back to so the... you make a new one, then it's good then. Correct, yes. Tobias. Yeah, hi, I'm Tobias T. Stuckler. Um, so just to sort of follow up on what, what Gabor said, because I've been part of the multilingual initiative, so I've been basically at the other end of what he just said, and I... As a, like as a member of the of the team, I feel there was like it was a really successful um, initiative, and we really did a lot of things right. And I don't really know like what Gabor did to make it that way, so I'm definitely gonna <laughs> go to your session as well to find out maybe. Um, but the thing you you mentioned, I really think I just want to highlight that again um, because that was something that was very like very important and very successful for me personally um, because I've been. Uh, like during some periods I've been very involved in like writing a lot of patches and doing a lot of stuff but then other times I just have not been doing anything or not very much um, just for like general personal life issues um, and so then I always or I often have that feeling of like um, like guilt that you know I should have really done more um, and I should have invested more time in everything um, but Gabor would like never like he said, he would always focus on praising, like like at the next event where I would come, and then I would be like, oh, Gabor, I'm so sorry that I didn't come to the meeting the last uh, few weeks or whatever, and Gabor would never say, like, yeah, you're bad, but he would instead, like, literally focus on, on 
well, it's really awesome that you came, and we should, like, here's this issue that we could uh, use your insight on, and, you know, so he would, like, totally um, have that ability to, to, like, just remove my guilt and turn that into something positive, and I think that was, for me personally, um, something that, like, in, in terms of the multilingual initiative, I didn't feel any any burnout uh, at all during the initiative. So that was like, that was the one thing I wanted to say. Um, the other thing I wanted to say regarding um, maintainers, I think that, um, just like Albert said as well, I think one one problem or one thing that causes burnout um, or, or frustration is the lack of control. So I think, I really think it's great that we now have the new governance structure and I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, but I think we should still give more power to our subsystem maintainers. Like I think, even though we've talked about this for years and there have been a lot of arguments pro and con, I still very strongly feel um, that we should give commit access to our subsystem maintainers um, because like I think the one example we have is with Jennifer Hodgson that's only allowed to commit documentation patches even though like we can't literally control that. Like she could commit like a complete subsystem rewrite like in terms of the actual git access. But like she wouldn't ever do that. Like she's never done that, and it's like a very—I mean—we have a very c good record with that. And I think in general we also have a very good record with like trusting people with stuff, even though we can't like actually um, um, prevent them from doing it. So I think we should actually just go ahead and take that step and let people like module maintainers um, just commit to like. The, I mean, there are certain modules. I mean, maybe we could like introduce it step by step, but there are certain modules like for a module or something that no one really cares about. And I'm, I mean, it's, you know, it's just a fact. So I'm not sure it's really a good uh, investment of our time if like Alex Pot or Webchick or Catch spend time reviewing patches for forum module, like why can't the maintainers of forum module just, you know, so that's, that's one point. Um, and the third point is in, as a follow up to what um, Webchick said, um, I think the the release cycle is very important to to burn out, like as as she said, like because we're now in bug fix mode. Um, but I also think that in general, um, like bringing out new versions of Drupal is really sort of rewarding. It's like a positive feedback loop because you have like a problem in your Drupal seven site, like on a client site, and then you open an issue and fix the bug, and then when Drupal eight comes out, you're like you know, you have a Drupal 8 site and you're like, wow, I don't have this bug anymore because I fixed it. So it's a really positive feedback loop. But the problem is that, like, since it took five years to get Drupal 8 out, like, that's a really long feedback loop. Like, that's <laughs> that's not a loop anymore. So I think what would really be positive is we, if we could somehow actually manage to to get shorter release cycles. That I think that in itself would greatly decrease um, burnout. Mm. Yeah. So what I hear is that for like people that are not maintainers, getting a commit in Drupal core is already a success, but for the maintainers, the success is not each single commit, it's the actual release, and that takes like five years, and I yeah. completely agree, that's not a loop anymore. Yeah. Um, so so I think with with the changes that we already started to, imp or will now come, that's a lot of the things you address, but I completely agree with you, and it also matches the things that, that we heard from Dries yesterday with the feature branches, which could lead into sub maintainer or subsystem maintainers to having commit, uh, but but I agree we should maybe just try it. Like it's good if something bad happened, you can go back anyway. So it's yeah, I would agree. Hi, my name is Christopher Wiglund, and about this question, what we could do to make Drupal more sustainable for community. Um, in in my, I'm part of other association in uh, locally, and there we have this kind of notion that people before activity. So even though the activity is really important for the association, it's kind of the branding. It should not go over the people. In that case, we put down the activity. It's not that important. It's more important with the people. And I think that mentality should go into Drupal also people before features. So if we see that oh, Drupal 9 uh, should have this video uh, on demand function and we don't have people, we, we should be saying that people before function, we, we skip it. And it should be um, kind of um, a mantra in people so they know that people before features. 
um, because they could because it's much easier for people that feeling I'm almost burning out because I have too too much pressure to to just take a step back and to realize it's better for me to be uh, to be a person than to be some committer. So uh, that's I think is a really important thing to to get to notion and then to people to know that people before features because if a a customer or a company needs a feature, they can pay for it. They they can have put uh, developers. We are an open source community, so for us, our value is the people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I guess you are saying that we should first make sure that we have a res resources before we commit to do something. Yeah, to see that, do, are we able to do it? Yes. Like a, a Drupal camp in, in Sweden, uh, should, we, should we do it just, to, just for the course to have one? Or should we see it the people? And yes. in that case, just, you know, we don't do a Drupal camp in Sweden because we don't have the people. And it's okay. Mm -hmm. It should not seem as a failure. And we need to re raise that up to say it's not a failure because we prioritize people. That's a win. That's a very good point. Um, actually, the events organizers were also very active on the survey, so there was a lot of event organizers. Um, I, I, what I've heard also is that e organizing events can be very, very stressful, and it can burn out people. Um, one positive tip I heard from uh, Drupal Camp Vienna organizers is that they try to organize Drupal Camp only every other year if they feel so. Uh, so if they don't feel organizing a Drupal camp, they just don't do it. And they don't take pressure for not organizing the event. Uh, and that's a, well, I think that is a very healthy mindset. Because you don't commit to do something every year because of the fact that something needs to be done. Just when people feel like they want to do something, they do, do it. Does anyone else has something to say? I, I just want to share a, 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 a trick. So my personal trick is to never take the bus. Never ever take the bus. Um, that basically leads. I mean, I'm. I mean, to I need to walk like at least thirty minutes to get to anywhere, and this is my best trick since I I started that like two months ago, and since then my life completely changed. Seriously. Yeah, so yeah, I have to walk everywhere. I mean, or take like my bicycle. But um, yeah, just just a small trick. Maybe I mean it's obviously not that easy like in the US where <laughs> everything is spread out <laughs> like hell. Um, but at least like in Europe, it's it's doable if you live in a city. Well, but you could like put your car a couple of hundred feet away from your office and then you walk the last part. Yeah. I mean, there there's a lot of ways of, of doing. Yeah, it's it's certainly quality quality mm. time. Yeah, and. Um, also, like, you can also do the plus one thing afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts? So one thing I was, I was, I was wondering if, and it's more an idea, but um, if we, I mean, we have people at, like, Drupal cons that are, defined as if you have a problem, you can go to these, like the Drupal Code of Conduct defined these. But I'm not really sure if we have something like that inside of the community as a whole. So if there, we maybe should have something that if people feel burned out, that they can go, go to somebody or to, I don't know, find help. Is there anything like yeah, that? Yeah, so this is WebCheck again. We do actually have something like that, which is called the Community Working Group. And the community working group predominantly these days handles uh, conflict resolution. So mm -hmm. when people disagree strongly yeah. um, in an issue, we will never make a technical call. Like yeah. we can't tell you whether the function should be named spazbot or flap blap or whatever, but we can help deal with the people problems. And so we have done things like um, either appointed a third party to sort of mediate between like a trusted third party. Sometimes we take on issues ourselves if it's a really nuclear issue and it's burning out lots of people. 
Uh, we, we've collectively worked to make sure that in our code of conduct, our conflict resolution is not at to do anymore. There's an actual process that involves yep. predominantly people solving their own problems, but mm -hmm. failing that, escalating to us, and we can provide mediation or, in a, in a worst case scenario, reject, you know, eject someone from the community if they're a real big yep. problem. Um, fortunately, we haven't had to do that yet, but yes. And the community working group, though, has a more holistic mission than that. So, for example, we did the the, um, the award, the Aaron Winborn Award, for for to recognize a really great community member. I think that would be the ideal um, group through which to funnel something like this. Um, and the community working group, I know, um, is planning to kind of create a sort of a working group team relationship. So, in other words, it's not just the four really super busy people that run everything, but instead it would be sort of a, an equivalent between, say, the documentation working group and the documentation team, where we could have like a community team. And I think that would be a really great thing for this kind of process mm -hmm. where um, if people were feeling burnt out, there's sort of be identified people in the community who were really safe people to talk to about that and, and that sort of thing. So I would say talk to Donna Benjamin okay. about that idea because I think the community working group is, is the ideal place for that to take place. Mm. Because like what, what I feel about, I mean, in conflicts, it's pretty clear that there is a conflict because you can read it. But the problems of, of being stressed or burned out, it happens f somebody himself at home. And maybe some of the maintainers realize that the person doesn't come to IRC channels anymore. So it could maybe it's it's more subtle to figure that out. And um, so, mm -hmm. but then definitely let's let's do. Well, it it's now. interesting because every burnout case we deal, or every conflict case we deal with, ninety nine percent of the time it's really burnout. And so we end up working with that okay. person to try and resolve it. But ideally, we could intervene way sooner. Right. Till it, not even you know, have because once conflict. it manifests itself as us yelling at each other in the issue queue, now we're burning out other people. So it's like a ripple effect, mm -hmm. right? So ideally, when someone starts to feel themselves going down that path, there'd be a way for early intervention and and mm -hmm. and healing and stuff. So, and um, just one other thing I want to add to that, just to remember that there is a lot of local things happening. So it would be, especially for me, the local. Uh, local contributions I was doing was the, was the part that was bur burning me out. Because it might be a less active contributor and it's a little bit for, like away from the global community and you are free to do almost anything at there. And if no one is saying anything there, people can just mess around as much as they want to. And yeah, it can create its own problems. I mean, in the issue queues, there is so many eyes that can see what's happening. But when it's happening in some someone's local community, someone local community, it can be very hard to try to try to see what's happening. And not all the communities are working that transparently at uh, at the places. So it can happen in some obscure places. Hi, uh, my name is Joel Patet, and I'm um, one of the theme comb system maintainers. Um, I I really like some of those suggestions, and um, I, they, they really kind of show how you get to the burnout, and a lot of things come from, like, you, you have stress to start, and, and then it goes to burnout. Um, I just, like, at the, like, the start, I'm, I'm not sure if I have a total solution for this yet, but, uh, and I'm not very good at it, so don't try to follow me if, I, if you see me doing this. But, like, um, I find that some of the times I'm, I'm most stressed is uh, because I haven't eaten properly. Mm -hmm. And um, if I haven't eaten, I get angry, and I yell at somebody for something stupid, and then it, <laughs> it kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it turns into, like, this um, really bad thing. And if I, if I, I remember, like, if I've, I have eaten, I actually feel, like, way better, and I seem like I f feel more helpful to people, and, um, yeah, I feel like I have a little bit more control mm -hmm. over things. I so there it's like a, like a starting point for I mean, for there me. is a, a, the sentence hangry. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's definitely something <laughs> that, like, that. we have in our, in, in our team is that we look at each other and then, like, sometimes you feel like, okay, like, you should eat now. And then we force each other to eat because, yeah, eating is a big part of that. Hi, uh, my name is Valentin. I uh, work for Sucuri. We are a security company. And um, somebody talked about conflicts and how they rose from virtually nothing. So we are a distributed team. We are in like 16 countries. So everybody works remote. And everybody talks on Slack, right? So you have, uh, there's all these internal channels, and there's a random channel. Like, 
anything that doesn't go into a specific channel, you just throw in there. Usually nobody looks at it, but at times, so like last week, somebody, uh, maybe you know the Albanian virus, like there's a snapshot with a virus saying, please, you know, install me because I'm from a poor country, blah, blah, which at first, you like, you smile about it, but mm -hmm. the person actually posting it on the channel forgot that we have two members of our team from Albania. So one of them really took it personally. Like, why do you, you know, why do you say something like that? He didn't invent the drawing himself. He just found it somewhere online. But the actual issue was not the drawing itself, not, but the problem that, you know, a, a poorer country compared to whatever other country. And from all of that, management kind of a really nicely intervened and like, hey, why don't you all of you start doing videos about your country? Like, where do you live? What's your surrounding? Like, what do you see out your window right now? Because you work remotely, so maybe somebody's in a cafe, somebody's at home. I don't know. And people started producing all this internal content that is now still going on. And everybody's like, well, maybe self-praising his country, his surrounding, but something like... Yep. You you see more than just a nickname on Slack or just a username on you know on the system. You see the person. You see where he lives, where he goes to eat, what what does he usually do, and another advice for the burnout: sleep. It's it's okay if you don't eat sometimes, but you have to sleep, really. So it's like if you work at one two a.m., that's not production. That's just killing yourself. Mm -hmm. I think Thank you. one really interesting point on on knowing that there are actual humans behind usernames on Drupal.org is that what I see is that more and more teams start to have Hangout channels rather than just IRC meetings, which for some people can be intimidating to actually be on a video, but I think it, it helps to, um, to also be able to communicate on another level than just actual writing. So and it's also helping the ones that maybe get to be selected to speak somewhere, any kind of a small big conferences to actually practice that. You know, right. when you practice in front of a mirror, it's just like seeing yourself. Mm -hmm. But when you actually talk to three, four, five, ten other people, actually maximum ten on the Hangouts, uh, <laughs> then you can yeah. you know, practice. Thank you. Hello, Lewis Nyman. Um, I'm interested in talking about how we identify burnout, um, especially um, when we don't really see each other. Um, I think it's really hard to just look at someone's work or their output and identify burnout if you don't really understand that what their life is like and um, the kind of person they are. Um, their other, um, the other responsibilities they have in their life, you know, if you have loads of kids and stuff and you're being asked to do a lot, it's very different. Um, so I think... Um, like something we do in, in Wondercrowd because we're all distributed um, and we don't have the ability to look someone in the eye and, and see if they're stressed. Um, we we have like um, enforced social time where we actually mm -hmm. hang out and the we don't talk about work. We just talk about what we're doing at the weekend, what's going on in our personal lives and stuff because otherwise we never do it yeah. because we always talk about work all the mm -hmm. time. And that's something that we, we have that same problem in the Drupal community is we only talk about like work all the time, unless we're at events like this. But when we're not together, then all we do is talk about, you know, when we're gonna get this done, how's this gonna work? Um, something else we do at Wonder Crowd as well is we have a buddy system. Mm -hmm. um, so you always have someone who you know you can talk to if you have any problems, and it's really important. Um, and I think something like that for maintainers um, at least would be really good, because I've spoken to maintainers before who struggle with that role and what is what they think is required of them and what they, and what they are un, how they're unsure about how they act. Yeah, I really like the body system. Uh, I think um, that's definitely something that could work to even maybe enforce it, or I don't know how exactly, but to just have somebody that I can go to, and also a person that is a bit responsible of the other person to make sure that person is still happy, especially in the environment right now where we are, where it's really like the last the last couple of things, and it's just that the, the, the end is, is the hardest part, um, no matter if it's now in releasing a website or finishing a, a, a major update in Drupal. Um, so I think that's a really cool thing that, that, that we could take over. Yeah. And just to add there, like, even though we don't have a body system right now in the Drupal community, I feel like I, I don't know how, how I could manage all the situation I have to face at some point if I couldn't talk to someone. So sometimes I get a little bit afraid how the people who can't talk to anyone, who don't feel like talking to anyone, how are they managing then? Yeah, I think that's also really important, destigmatizing these kind of conversations. I think Mike Bell's um, keynote tomorrow will be a really good 
presentation to talk about mental health and try and get people to talk about it more openly. Mm -hmm. I think we need to figure out how we do that as well, just in the community. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, Scott uh, Kotzer. Um, thank you very much for this. Um, uh, yeah, I agree with, I mean, a lot of what everyone said, really. Um, I've experienced burnout before, and I felt like it was something I had to keep a secret, basically, uh, as being, like, also one of the theme system maintainers. Um, and, I mean, there's some good aspects, like, um, in the theme system, I feel like we do sort of have, like, a buddy system where, like, we're able to kind of lean on each other a bit when, like, some people have more time, some people have less time. But there's also things, like, even in the um, new community governance Thing, which I think is improved, or maybe not community governance, but the governance thing for core. Um, I think there's even a line in there where it's like, there's certain, if, if issues need like um, feedback from the maintainers, it's like you need to check that within five days or something like that. So like I feel like a lot of, uh, at least in my opinion, like a lot of, or in, in my experience anyway, a lot of this kind of stems from feelings of like guilt or shame. So just the fact that we kind of need to be that available as maintainers is a little bit, can be a little bit scary. Because like, you know, maybe you have something personal come up, like with your family or with your health, maybe you just want to go on vacation, and it's like, you, you may even feel worried that like something might happen if you just go away for a little while. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think like, if we can somehow structure our community how we work a little bit better so that we're not just counting on like small groups of people like just to so it kind of it echoes like what I think Laurie was saying earlier where if we could have just more maintainers even if they're not as active I think that would be help helpful even if they're like supporting so yeah but yeah thank you very much for for doing this so I think this is the last one we can take. So I, just to follow up on what Scott said, I think that um, the theme system maintainers um, is a really good example of having a good team of people. There's four or five maintainers or something who really support each other. And I think that um, I've struggled in the CSS maintainership role being the only one. Um, technically, there's two, but I'm the only active one. And how we maintain maintainers.txt is another thing. But I think maybe like trying to enforce a rule where we have always more than one maintainer, it means that someone doesn't feel like the, like the entire pressure of everything is on them. Yeah. Thanks. Oh yeah, JavaScript is another really good example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do want to point out the five days rule is only that there's a response of some kind. So it can say, hey, I'm on vacation and I'm not going to get to this for three weeks and that's fine. It's just a set expectation because we're trying to solve the other end of the burnout spectrum, which is I made something and no one gave a shit and it's sad it needs review for 700 years. Um, but the thing I would point out in terms of adding more maintainers, we do have the concept of provisional maintainers. So everyone in this room or everyone listening to this who is a maintainer of a thing, if there's someone who helps you or someone who you see who's like, they could be good, I don't know for sure, we can make them a provisional maintainer and that would help with that, you know, the because I agree, we want as many maintainers as possible. Well, not too many, because <laughs> you've got to be able to make a decision. But we definitely want as many maintainers as possible so people can get, um, you know, feedback or support or that kind of thing. And if there's any doubt about whether this person's really a maintainer or not, we can make them a provisional maintainer and then move them to full maintainership in like a couple months. So that's one way to help with that. Um, especially for CSS and JavaScript, it seems like we could easily find people who know enough about that to at least be trusted with provisional maintainership. So that's one thought there, anyway. Thanks. Yes. I so think as we, we discussed, done. we have to eat and we all need food, so that's time now. <laughs> yes. Let's do that now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.